I just need a countdown from you. Oh, you already Three. you already had it ready. Fingers ready. Three, two, one. Welcome to Crosstown Cardboard Episode Two. I'm Carmine at Carmine's Cards, the broadcaster. That is Craig, New York City Sports Cards, the teacher, aka Teach. And today's topic is trading art and science. So we'll get into the math. We have a math teacher there, and that's the science. You know, STEM is a very popular subject for kids to get into these days. And then we'll get into the art, the creativity, the fitting the puzzle pieces together to make a deal happen. But first, we want to say thanks for everybody watching the first episode. You know, we just jumped in there, me and Craig, opposite sides of New York City to create Crosstown Cardboard. And we got so many great responses from Instagram. Uh, and then Facebook and, um, you know, my parents were watching, my girlfriend was watching and listening, and I'm sure your wife and family was watching too. And so it really was just so nice to be welcomed like that, to just start off in a podcast episode one and to have, you know, so many people saying, good job, love what you're doing, love the enthusiasm and the passion and the excitement and the escape for the hobby. And so we just wanted to say before jumping into our topic of episode two, Thank you for joining us originally for episode one and continuing to stick around. Yeah, I had a lot of fun doing episode one. And my father, he appreciated the referencing last time when we talked about flipping cards, because flipping cards back in the day is different than it was, than it, uh, than we know it to be. But I am loving uh, the feedback we got from the podcast. The more I say Crosstown Cardboard, it's got a nice ring to it. And remember, let's not forget, this is about the cards. So what are it's we going to talk about, about today? Cards. It's always about the cards. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, Craig, I mean, we're going to talk about first, you literally rushed back from a trade night in New York City to join the pod. So what happened over on that trade night? Well, before the trade night, my my girls' varsity soccer team caught a quick double overtime win. So okay. the juices were flowing. Listen, it's only the second win of the season, but we'll take the victories. So the juices were already flowing. I went right from the game, quickly home, said hi to my wife, pet my dog, and I was on my way to Bleecker Trading Ooh. for trade night, which they do every other month or so. And if you are anybody in the hobby, you have at the very least heard of Bleecker. Bleecker mm -hmm. is a social club, hangout, cards and coffee owns uh, half, half of the space, so they're like your regular LCS. But every once in a while, uh, Bleecker hosts, hosts uh, trade night which is free to come in, and it's collectors around New York City. There's always a host. So today, Prism God and Prism Goddess were there, and it was, <laughs> it was just amazing seeing friends in the hobby, uh, looking at other cards, making moves, and it, it's always a good time at Bleecker. The hospitality is bar none. And, you know, every once in a while, we need an event that kind of revitalizes how we're feeling. You know, not that I ha was ha feeling any hobby fatigue, but I just got back from the trade night at Bleecker feeling like good, ready to go. Damn, I love this hobby. I love the people in it. <laughs> so only positive energy that came out of that. Hey, that's great. So positive energy, Prism God and Goddess, those are big names, a big family in the hobby. So I know you wouldn't be as juiced unless you picked up something. So what happened over there? So I actually didn't pick up anything tonight. Okay. I, I made a pickup a few days ago. Now, you know, the soccer juices are flowing for me. The World mm -hmm. Cup's come in, and I just acquired the card you see on the screen, which is a Kylian Mbappe. And if you – let me scroll a little bit so you can see. Kylian Mbappe, 2020 Merlin Chrome. Merlin is a soccer brand, and it's actually a brand, uh, an older brand, but just the new okay. Chrome version, the first year it came out is 2020. So what you're seeing on the screen is a Kylian Mbappe red refractor, in a PSA 10 numbered out of 10. Ooh. Uh, something in, something I really like about this card, other than the player itself and the color, which I'll get into, is it's card number 100. And Carmine, if you know me, you know I always keep it 100. You so keep it a buck all the time. I, exactly. So this was perfect for me. Uh, Kylian Mbappe, young player, plays for France, plays for PSG. And if you're a casual soccer fan, the guy knows how to score goals. When the ball is at his feet, he's just going to take you at pace. And he's a player that I plan on watching for the next decade or so. Now, hey, there you go. You referenced math earlier. So let's get into the numbers. Okay. 
you know, this is a private sale, right? So the comp is not out there, but I'm comfortable sharing it because I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I was able to acquire this card for $850. Now Ooh, I looked okay. at the same exact card. This is the red refractor numbered out of 10 in the PSA 10. The, the Erling Holland recently did about 1800 and the Messi of this card did around 2100. So, you know, given Mbappe's wow. global popularity, uh, what I think will be many, many, many years of goals ahead, considering 850 relative to those two other big names, to me, it felt like a good buy. And this really isn't a card I plan on just flipping. I, I want to hold this because as his career continues to blossom, maybe he wins another World Cup. Maybe he transfers in January, Real Madrid, time will tell. It's going to be fun to have this asset as his career continues to go. And Real Madrid, Craig, you'll be very proud of me because I woke up at 7 o'clock a.m. Pacific time to watch El Clasico between Real Madrid and my favorite soccer team since I just went to Barcelona for a friend's wedding, Barcelona which Real Madrid won three to one in dominating fashion. But that Mbappe with the Erlen Holland and Messi prices, you might be looking at doubling your money right there, it seems like. Yeah, maybe. And uh, first of all, I'm proud of you. You've obviously been a big Barcelona fan for every year, every year for the last one year. So good for you for <laughs> right? loyal to your team. But I, so I said I didn't pick anything up tonight at trade night. But I, I bought that card, and right before I bought it, I looked into my inventory. I'm like, okay, I know if I want to buy this, I'm going to have to move some stuff. So I kind of pieced a few, through, uh, a few items of mine, figured, okay, I know I'm going to sell this. Here's what it comped at. Here's what I think I could get for it. And I was able to recoup 550 out of the 850 tonight. So I got most of it back, and that was my game plan. Right, I went into trade night knowing that I wanted to move some stuff, and I did. This card has not been delivered in hand yet. It should arrive tomorrow, but I'm, I'm excited to have it. I just think it looks amazing. The red refractor for me triggers like childhood, the old Topps Chrome baseball sets where red refractors are always out of 10. Uh, I like the way they, even though we might not be playing for PSG for too much longer, I do like the way the red complements the red PSG uniform and just a fun card. And now it's my best Mbappe card and I'm going to enjoy it. And that's a great investment, um, you know, going into the next World Cup. So that's your recent pickup. Let's check out. We see some smiling faces of me if you're watching on the Crosstown Cardboard YouTube. But I'll show you real quick what I picked up this week from Australia, which I'm having a lot of fun um, dealing with people from Australia. Like great disposition. Everybody's friendly, willing to work with you. And uh, so that's been a side note. That's been great. But check out this Devin Booker. Uh, like if you're watching on YouTube, BGS95, and Craig, I know you commented on Instagram when I put it up on my story saying clean, which it really is. It's a true 9.5, true gem, rookie auto, prism, uh, Devin Booker. It's a sticker, but, I mean, it's an iconic brand being prism, so I was fine with that being a sticker. Usually I'm a stickler for uh, on card. How about this Akeem PSA 8 rookie? This is like a $200, $250 card, but I feel like it's well worth it for uh, what you're getting. And then the Joker. We have a select on-card auto at a 60, Nikola Jokic. Uh, and so I was pretty excited to pick up those three. The only downside is the shipping internationally, uh, which is like a suspense you know, thing times... 10 to get it internationally so those are our recent pickups and craig we're going to get into the art and the science behind trading and we're going to break down a few trades we specifically did one involving you and Giannis Antetokounmpo and one involving how i got my first jordan auto a few months back which was kind of a crazy situation okay let me ask you what is the definition of a successful trade what makes a trade good? We talked about this. We what talked makes about this. Trade perfect. You taught me, you coached me, and I believe what we said was when both people end up happy with the deal. Boom, and that's it. Forget about forget about the numbers. Forget about the players. If you and I are trading and you're happy and I'm happy, that is a good trade. Whatever way you slice it. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, so we're we're both sides happy with your Giannis trade that you're going to break down. 
I would say so. So this was uh, this was an interesting one and something I talked about. If you want to share the screen, I have the Giannis. There it is. Yes, sir. Something I talked about last episode was everything in this hobby is having patience. Mm -hmm. right. So I picked this card up off of Facebook. And I remember I traded a Giannis Select Gold Wave, which is not the numbered version. So it's like a diet gold, if you will. Um, okay. <laughs> I also had a, it was a Kobe LeBron 2008, 2009 SB game used dual Jersey and a PSA eight. So I traded those two cards, some cash and the Giannis was valued around 1200 at the time. And I remember based on what I was into those two cards for, essentially it cost me around 900 to a thousand out of pocket. So let's say I was into this card for a thousand. I thought okay. this was super cool game used, uh, chunky patches, a true, Prism Black, one of one. And wow. I remember I posted the card and Rob, our good buddy, sports card therapist, he commented, that's a sweet Greg Monroe card. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it, it didn't occur to me that, you know, dual cards with dual players could be a little bit of a risk because even though Big it's risk. true black, even though it's Giannis, even though it's game used, I mean, let's address the elephant in the room. Greg Monroe's on the card. The moose. He's the moose in the room. He is. Nice. Didn't even know that was his nickname. You learn something new every day. Yes. So see, I tried yeah, to that, and that's what I would say too is like, you know, like you see the Dennis Rodman, Kevin Garnett behind me, the dual auto. I'm like a sucker for dual autos now all of a sudden. And you have the Bernard King and Walt Frazier over your left mm -hmm. shoulder. But Love to that. me, no offense to the this might be Greg Monroe's best card, to be honest, to be on the card with Giannis together. But to me, and you're going to reveal it in a second of what you got for it. Greg Monroe hurts that card a lot to me, but it's still super cool because of the game used one of one. So I can see where the factors would kind of even out there. But you know how certain cards you get and you kind of lose interest in. So I liked this mm -hmm. for a while because I was really stacking a lot of Giannis cards. And he, he's a player that I completely believe in short, medium, long term. I mean, the resume already, and the guy's only 27. It's crazy what more he could accomplish. But I, um, once I lost interest in this card, I really struggled to move it. And I think it's just the obscurity. And it is a one-on-one, -on -one, so there's no comp. But with a weird card like that, you just have to find the right buyer. So yep. I was, ironically enough, I'm just piecing this together now, I was at another bleaker trade night over the summer. It was a week before national, like the national tune-up. All right, everyone's making their moves. They're getting some inventory. And I found someone who was interested in this card. And the final trade was, is I gave him this Giannis plus $150 cash. Mm -hmm. And in return, I got a Zion Optic Orange Rookie PSA 9, which is not really a card that's my type of card, but it's liquid, right? It's a, it's a name yes. brand. It's Optic. It's Orange. It's Zion. I got this Kevin Durant Rookie jersey. I think it's a, an autograph. I think it's a vent worn and sticker auto. And this car, which is super sweet, um, a 2012-13 Panini Flawless game-worn patch out of 10. And you could see, if you're looking on YouTube, it's the whole R from uh, his last name, Durant. Yeah, that, that, that one's especially sick. Yeah, no, I like this one. So I ended up uh, trading the Zion at 300 value. I ended up trading the Kevin Durant jersey auto at 700 value. Is it, was that a rookie, Craig? It is a rookie. And I ended up trading that at National – plus cash for a Michael Jordan exquisite game-worn jersey. No-brainer. And I sold this Durant on eBay for, I think it was 1000 and then after fees, 800 and something. So I was patient with this Giannis. I had it for many months. I ended up with these three cards, which I did all move. But I ended up getting roughly like 1800 value out of the Giannis because I practiced patience. And what were you right. into the Giannis and Greg Monroe one of one again for? I was into – that Greg Monroe grail for around a thousand. So hey, and, okay. So you made eight, you made eight hundred. Yeah. And all all anything I made for it, anything I traded, it all went right back into the hobby. And I really so, wanted that because that's first year flawless, right? It is. I actually kind of wish I still had that because I don't own I wish you would have sold it to me. I know you miss me by like a week. It is technically said, the you, you asked me, you asked me, what do you think you valued it at? And I said, because I deal with a lot of flawless stuff. And I said, well, that's because you're flawless. Around a thousand. That's very sweet of you. I'm still wearing makeup from the six o'clock newscast. That's probably I'm why. I'm sure you crushed it. So I tried, but it's not as fun as this. 
And so after fees, you basically sold it for what I probably would have paid for it. But live and you learn. What, what what can you do? What can Listen, you do? That, okay. That, that's, we've only done one deal in, in our friendship. So that's uh, there's something very charming about that. Yes. Well, that's true. We, we right now are a one of one. Boom. And uh, so let me get to my one trade that I did for a Jordan real quick. And I'll set it up uh, by saying I went to Hoodies Collectibles in Bend, Oregon. And, um, and so I just went in like... My girlfriend was getting a new Subaru Forester. Well, it was pre-owned, but it was new for us. And so she went up there. That's the only place in Oregon that had it. It was about a three-hour drive. So I said, I'll drive with you, but the only thing I want is to stop at Hoodie's Collectibles. So she said, okay, fine. So we get the Forester, whipping it around, stop at Hoodie's Collectibles. I just walked in, and I brought my case just in case because you never know what's going to happen. So I walk in, I'm looking around. I didn't really like a lot of stuff because I'm mainly like on-card autos, game-used patches, kabooms, downtowns, and vintage or iconic rookie cards. That's mainly what I like, flawless stuff. So there wasn't really anything. But then I saw this card, this Jordan right on the bottom rack, 4K price tag on it. So I said, ooh, that's steep. But then I looked at the comps. I'm like, okay, it's about last one did three grand, 3,500. It was around there. So I start talking to Andrew, the kid at the front desk, nice kid. And I'm like, hey, I'm interested in, in you know, this Jordan. What can we do for it? Do you guys do trades? He's like, oh, yeah, we do trades. I'm like, okay. So I brought in my case. He saw what I had and he immediately started, he immediately FaceTimed the owner, Tate, mm. got him on FaceTime. I'm like, I don't want to disturb you guys, but okay, let's, let's deal here. So, uh, so the owners on FaceTime, the owner of hoodies collectibles, great guy, very fair. And we start going through my cards and we start trying to agree on values. And some of them we didn't agree on, but some of them we were kind of like in between. So I was like, all right, if you'll do 150 on this one, I can come down to 250 on that one. So we were like negotiating back and forth anyway, ended up being, these 12 cards you see on the screen, uh, and if you're not watching and you're listening, I'll go through them real quick. It's an Anthony Davis Flawless Auto, Bill Walton Exquisite Rookie Patch Auto, uh, LeBron Topps Chrome Rookie PSA 8, a Damian Lillard In-Flight Auto numbered out of 35 on card, Peyton Manning Game Used Patch uh, Auto, Damian Lillard Old Dominion Auto, Peyton Manning Flawless out of 5 Auto, Emmett Smith, National Treasures Auto, Jamal Murray, Noir, RPA, uh, Nick Bosa, Rookie Auto, PSA 10, numbered out of 149, Damian Lillard, Immaculate Game Used Patch, Rookie. And the thing that closed the deal, funny enough, was that Terrell Owens, On Card Auto, Skybox Autographics, which to me is one of the best sets, uh, iconic set. You took and the so, word out of my mouth. Yeah, and so it was funny because I wanted to add this in. To me... You can have a card that's awesome at a $50 value, which that is, last comp. And you can have like a card that nobody wants that's worth $1,000 or the last comp was 1000 So to me, it's all about, is this a good use of my money for how cool, rare, and liquid this card is? Which the TO was at 50 and end up closing the deal. So I always keep my notes. This is every single card I have. And we'll get to our viewer questions in a few minutes, which kind of harps back to this. Every single card that I own, and I'm holding up my handwritten sheets, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, I have written down what I'm into it. So I know exactly what I can move it for. So I knew if I traded all those, I would be into the Jordan for 2170 Okay, and I'm like, Carmine, I see you. So I'm like, all right, let me, because like, for example, based on little trades, and this is the accumulation of months of getting these cards and trading into them, cash and trade deal, take a little cash out, add a little cash in to get leveling up or leveling down, depending on what's smart. So like that Murray Noir RPA, we valued at like 300, 350 in the trade. I was into for nothing based on past trades. I'll give you an example. Mental so I was math, into that right? Jordan for 2170. What Were you saying something? 
I was saying, you know what you're into it because you're doing that mental math in your head. Exactly. I feel like a lot of people who participate in the hobby have to be naturally pretty good with numbers when you're do- making these deals. You, you got to, you don't see anyone sitting there with a the calculator. Well, I guess on your phone sometimes, but generally you do want to be quick with the, with the math when you're making it. Yes. And if you're not that quick and you don't know your stuff, you could lose out on the deal because you could lose steam, mm. you know? So uh, I'll just fast forward how this trade, the art and the science continued through getting that Jordan. So I got that Jordan for a twenty one hundred and seventy dollar value. So fast forward, I'm shopping it around a little bit, but I'm not like crazy about moving it because it was my first Jordan auto and I was super excited. Then I saw this card on my boy Mikey's cards, uh, legend in the hobby, and we both you know know him decently well. And I got that from Mikey's cards, which we valued at twenty five hundred. He added fifteen hundred on top of this Magic and Kareem dual on card auto ultimate collection at a twenty five BGS nine with a ten auto. Incredible card. Oh three oh four. If I'm correct, no. Um, I think it was 0506. And at one point, I had the matching Larry Bird from the same year, but I also sold that because I kind of got an offer I couldn't refuse. So then I ended up, after the 1500 cash I took in, I ended up being into this card, which we valued at 2500 for only $670. Mm. So now I got a potential two grand I can make if I'm able to flip that. So fast forward a couple more months. I'm at a local show, maybe another. And actually, it was only another month after that. I got the Magic and Kareem, but I'm basically just displaying it. I don't really want to move it. This guy comes in at this little Mount Shasta High School gym in Northern California, probably like seven, eight tables. Not a lot of action. This guy comes in with this small case. He starts whipping out stuff. He's like, is that Magic and Kareem available? I'm like, eh, not really. He circles back around. Then I see what quality of stuff he has. I'm like, oh, this could be available, you know, because once I see what he's got, then that changes the game. I'm like, but if I was to move it, I'd have to have a $3,500 value on it because I really like the card. I got the matching Larry Bird at the time. You know, that 80s rivalry, Magic and Bird, as you know, is my favorite, you know, rivalry of all time. I said, if you hit that $3,500 mark, then I'll, I'll part with it. Nothing wrong with overvaluing a card you love at all. No. And then if somebody's willing to do that, then that's an extra bonus for you. I mean, if that's what it's going to take and you're willing to, to put that money in to do it, then that's fine. So after that, this guy starts pulling out the cards. And here's what I ended up getting on top of $875 in cash, which put me at a negative cost basis, a negative value into all these cards I got in trade, which we valued at about $2,700, which was pretty crazy. Here's the first one. This Dwayne Wade rookie auto SP signatures, BGS 10 with a 10 auto last sold for 2,800. Um, But I I ended up trading that for two grand. But I ended up being into it for negative $30 on a $2,000 card. And this is like the art and science of trading to get into some of these cards. Also, this Gilbert Arenas, this was cool. Shout out to Hibachi back in the day when he used to be just the like the original Steph Curry. I mean, shooting from Agent Agent Zero. Agent Zero, exactly. And this is a rookie auto, Topps Pristine 2001. Uh, PSA 1010 pop one. So I got that. Also got this Brian Erlacher Bowman Chrome rookie card, gem mint 10. This Tiger Woods BGS 10 upper deck rookie card, which I think is the best iconic pose on a modern day rookie card that you can find. And then finally, this Damian Lillard. This is let this is, I think, is a pop five. Uh, Panini one in one 2020 downtown. And the D Wade rookie was a pop 12. So I ended up being into those cards for negative 50, negative 40, negative 30, negative 30, and negative $30. So if I gave those away, it would have been a profit. And that's not really bragging. I mean, I'm happy about how we were able to do, but it's more so just to say like, 
with the patience that you mentioned and the trading and the adding cash and the just seeing what's out there and fielding offers and seeing how you can move. And if somebody's willing to hit your high value because you don't want to move a card and they end up hitting it, sometimes you got to part ways with it. And so that was the uh, story of getting the first Jordan auto, moving it into the Magic and Kareem duel, moving that into trading down, which I was fine with, into five different cards plus cash, and then moving those and ending up with a fun story, a fun journey of the roller coaster up and down, and a little more cash in the pocket too, which is always great. You get me going with all these numbers here. Big math guy. Um, as the kids say, that's uh, that's a W trade right there. But everybody and was happy. Was going back to what you said, Craig, everybody was happy with every one of those deals, which is yep. the most important thing. And friendships were formed through those deals too. So nobody's throat was slit. Nobody was feeling shafted or anything like that. And it ended up being great for everybody. I love it. And – you know, I, I talk about this, how I am a collector at heart and I collect Giannis. He, you know, I, I still have a lot of cards of his. That one duel in particular, I hit the point where I said, I don't want this anymore. I, I don't need this in my collection. Yep. So even though I don't have any of the three cards that I traded down for it, the Zion was part, I was able to use the Zion um, for part of a trade at National to get my Weston McKinney Super Factor, which I still have. And I was able to use the Kevin Durant rookie jersey auto to trade into a Michael Jordan exquisite jersey, which I still have. Personally, my goal when I'm acquiring cards is I want to pick up cards that I don't want to move. So right. it, even though it was like a, a couple moves behind, that Giannis helped me pick up PC cards that I still have and I really enjoy just looking at. And you know what else I realized? Because the market's going down. Everybody knows that if you just started collecting or if you've been in it for years and years, you know, right now the market is like kind of unpredictable. It's a lot of prospecting. It's going up and down. This guy gets hurt. The next week, his cards are down 50%. And what I think is also to your point of buying what you like and buying cards you don't plan to move, because if the market goes down, you're fine holding it for the price you want. You won't panic sell and be like, oh my gosh, Holland didn't make the World Cup. I forgot his team wasn't in it. And now his cards are down because the World Cup's going on. He's not in it. Now I got to panic sell. You'll be fine. You'll be like, oh, let's ride at this wave, you know, whatever. And, you know, the Bucks were eliminated from the playoffs early because Chris Middleton was hurt. I'm fine holding these Giannis. I don't need to panic sell at the bottom of the market for his prices. Great. And kind of unrelated, but also related if we're talking about trading. I was at a trade night tonight, and even though I didn't really directly trade with anyone, I was able to sell some of my cards to the shop, and I bought a card, my uh, Mbappe, from someone else. It's kind of like a three-team trade in that sense. I get mm -hmm. a card from someone, my cards go somewhere else. So that's fun. And they're actually also hosting a kids' trade night this Saturday, which I just think is awesome. You know, teaching... Uh, 13, 14, 15 year olds, the skills of trading and negotiating and people skills. Cause at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. And will any of your card club members, Craig, the high school club you formed in the New York City Public School District for kids to buy, sell, trade cards after school, give them a safe place to hang out? Will any of them be attending this trade night? I do believe I have one alumni who graduated last year attending, but it's really primarily for like middle and high school students. Okay. But I have uh, three or four different kids that I coach soccer who all also collect cards who will be attending on Saturday. So I always like to talk about how all my worlds, coaching soccer, teaching, card collecting, they all kind of collide into one. And here's a perfect example of that. So I'm riding the bus tomorrow to soccer practice with a few kids that I coach. They'll be going to trade night on Saturday. We talk cards. Then we go off and we do our soccer thing. It's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's really just a lot of fun. That's great. Just another avenue to try and build relationships, friendships, business partnerships, podcast partnerships with uh, all different diverse backgrounds of people. That's it. And uh, Card Club will be starting up soon, which will be plenty to talk about. And if you missed the first episode... I'm a high school teacher and I run an after school card club and I, I just such a big shout out to the hobby community for all their donations because don't those donations 
are why my students are able to have equity in cars because these are these are kids from the inner city. Like they don't have disposable income. They can't go out and rip a box or buy a hundred dollar slab. But if I teach them the necessary skills, they could take these free donations, which is equity, and turn that into a nice collection and sell and make some money, which they, they did last year. So I'm excited to get that started, teach them the art of trading. And it, it's good to see kids getting into it because it feels like the hobby, even with the down market, it, the hobby has gotten expensive. But there should be a way for kids to enter because otherwise it's going to die out. Totally, totally, 100%. And that's 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 what sports and sports cards and just having a club, a safe space to hang out, meet new people can do. And that kind of ties in, Craig, to – I was honestly surprised that we got some viewer submitted questions and topics. And that kind of ties into what one person wrote in asking about how to build up your collection on a budget. And I don't know if you can pull that word document back up again, if you want to share. Yeah, I'll, read it. Okay. I'll read it. So uh, a good buddy of mine, Dan Ogilvy, he's also an educator. And if you check out his Instagram page, Lakeside Collects, he talks about some of his cards and he incorporates his kids in the videos, which is so much fun. The kids tell stories. So to them, they have these cards of their favorite players. And his, him and his kids, they talk about why the card is important to them. But he asked the question. He said, we are new to the hobby and the majority of our cards are $75 or less. How do you balance staying within a budget, collecting what you enjoy, which we have done all along, but also moving up into bigger cards. Is there a thought process or system you use to manage your process? So thank you, Dan, for the question. Again, that's Lakeside Collects on Instagram. And I think that's a great segue because we were just talking about kids in the hobby and how could they trade up. So, Carmen, you got any ideas? How do you balance staying within a budget even if you have cards that are mostly you know, $100 or less? Yeah, well, I was listening to the Sports Card Therapist, which is my weekly – sports card therapy, along with my weekly personal therapy as well, which I think is really important too, mental health. And he had your Long Island boy, John, from Behind the Diamond, Long Island. Long Island. And, and uh, so he was on there, and he's now full-time into cards. Um, and he was saying that he originally started by just allocating a certain amount of money into his card fund, which is what I've done and not touching it, not adding in anymore because that's your card budget. That's your disposable income, your play money, your money that you don't care as much if you lose. Cause of course everybody cares if they lose money, but it's not going to shut off the lights. It's not going to, you know, make you run out of water, not have groceries. That's an important distinction. And I'm, I'm pretty interested in finance and numbers, as you might have been able to tell. I would recommend Dave Ramsey's financial advice. And he talks about budgeting, the debt snowball, making a budget and knowing exactly where your money's going. Your bills, your subscriptions, your groceries, your rent, your car, your gas, all that stuff. So then you know exactly how much money can I allocate to my hobbies or to going out, taking my wife on a date, whatever it may be. So if you have this $75 card deal and that's what you're allocated to, then I would say try to work that cash and trade. Try to see, okay, if I pair two $75 cards and I add $50 of cash, can I get a $200 card and slightly move up that way? Because if you let's say you got a deal, some of the trades that I've had have involved buying a card for a good price, let's say 80% of comps of what the card's going for, you pay 80%. Then you have another card you might've paid 80% on also, and you move both of those cards into another card if you trade and add cash. And now all of a sudden you might be into a $200 card for 160. Let's say you cash out that $200 card for 90% of comps. So you sell that $200 card for 180, now you just made 20 bucks. And if you keep rinsing and repeating and doing that enough times, or you do it at a bigger scale, because if you have a $500 card that you're into for 80% of comps, that means you're into it for 400. You sell it at 90% of comps, that's 450. You just made 50 bucks. And so you keep rinsing and repeating. And I would say that's a way to, to potentially build up that $75 deal. And 
you don't want to get too big for your britches. I remember Mikey's cards also on sports card therapist was talking about, it took him sometimes years to level up into from the $400 card range to like 700 into like a thousand to $2,000 cards because he didn't have buyers for those cards. So sometimes it doesn't make sense to get too big. Sometimes you want to operate in a range where there's a lot of buyers for what you have. I would actually be very interested to hear maybe perhaps an Instagram poll, like the, the range of cards that people buy in. Yeah. Like speaking for myself, I, I, I don't really dabble in five figure cards. I kind of stick to really 2000 and less. That's just where I feel comfortable. But to answer Dan's original question, how do you balance staying within a budget, but also trying to move up into bigger cards? I don't want to say taking a loss necessarily, but if you have two $75 cards that maybe equal up to 150 value, maybe be willing to trade two $75 cards for a card that's worth 125. Mm-hmm. So now you've got a little bit more of an expensive card and you can kind of just snowball that on the way up. And also quick note um, that I heard John from the behind the diamond also mentioned was if you are into a card for a thousand bucks, let's say that card dipped a little bit, you sell it for eight twenty five, eight fifty, but then you reinvest that eight fifty into an eight hundred fifty dollar card that then maybe goes up, or you bought it, you know, at eighty five percent of comps. Let's say that's actually a thousand dollar card that you paid eight fifty for. Then you trade that. For another thousand dollar card or whatever the move is and now all of a sudden you're back to even because you weren't afraid to take that loss re-get the money out of the system and then you know put it back in and uh see what you could do once you made that money so that seems like a good way and and stick to your budget you know don't think of it too much as gambling i would say uh and, and you know take our advice with a grain of salt we're just two average guys but i would say don't get over your skis. Like if that's the money you can put into sports cards, keep that and just try to play with it. See where you can, you know, maneuver and slowly snowball into more money with little victories. Don't try to hit a home run and lose everything. You know, you might want to take a big swing, but take a calculated risk. You said something about skis. I've only skied once and I hated it. I've never skied. I only know the phrase. Um, before we move on to the next question, shout out to John from Behind the Diamond. I've set up at his show several times, and he is a great promoter, and he just loves what he does. You yeah, can tell he's passionate clear. about it. Yep, um, yep. C- cards by Joe. So Joe's a Jersey guy. He's a regular buy, sell trader. I actually set up with him before at a last show. Just a okay. good quality person. That's cards underscore buy underscore Joe. And he said, give listeners an understanding of why you haven't been buying, selling, trading online as much as opposed to only telling us why you aren't. It would be helpful for listeners who are experiencing potential similar challenges online that you made to stop being active. So they don't feel like it's just them. Um, So basically why, essentially why am I buy sell trading online less? Uh, I, I've just one, I've gotten a little more pickier Two, There's an element of physically holding a card and seeing it in person that kind of tells me whether or not I want it. And also look, I play to my strengths. I, I consider myself a people person. I, I talk to kids all day, every day for a living. So I thrive in an environment where I'm face to face and I can negotiate the online. I just don't, doesn't, doesn't work as well for me. You know, if I'm just, again, this is just my own personal preference. Um, yeah, that, that, that's kind of, it is it, between being a little more pickier and f- just finding more success in person. I would say the vast majority of cards in my PC are not cards that I acquired via social media or Instagram. They came from shows. They came from trade nights. And that's just my own preference. You you seem to do really well on Instagram. I try because that's really my only option, you know, compared to you where you're in the Northeast where we both grew up. I'm spoiled. And now, now I'm in Southern Oregon where there's hardly any shows at all. And I just went up to Portland, which was great. I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is hustling, bustling. People are at the table. I was set up there in a couple tables. And the people at Portland who have set up there frequently were like, man, it's dead today. And I'm like, dead today? I'm like, this thing is popping off. I'm like, deals and wheeling and dealing because I'm used to hardly any activity. 
So I do most of my stuff. And I also know cards by Joe, great guy. And I've discussed, you know, he puts up cool Instagram polls and kind of curates some of the hobby knowledge and sees where people stand on different topics. And I also feel like the buying, the buying as far as people having cash has certainly slowed down for me uh, on Instagram and Facebook, but there's still a lot of deals. Like I just sold, for example, last week, I sold about a thousand dollars worth of cards, uh, four different cards, but it was on Facebook and one of the big Facebook groups. So I don't know if it's Instagram versus Facebook. I don't know if it's just generally the card market slowing down a little bit as far as people wanting to give cash, but I have noticed a lot more people are willing to trade. And so it might be more of a time to trade, add cash or take a little bit of cash out, maybe get a little bit of cash and be a little bit more creative. I would think as far as the deals you're making rather than expecting full cash, you have to know when to cash out. I would say like if something hits like 90% of comps, and you're into it for 80%, to me, I would say right now, cash out. Because you can reinvest that 10%. Because a lot of people aren't spending cash. So if you're spending cash at a time when people aren't spending, you might be able to make some more moves than in a usual time, I'd say. And I um, go another thing about you know why I don't do as line online as much and preferring in person. Uh, something my good friend Sam. So Sam Evans, he's an assistant principal in Philadelphia. On Instagram, he is the sports card collector, and he always preaches the value of human capital. Right, a big part of this hobby is it's not just the cards, but it's the relationships you make with people, getting to know and talk to people, and, and that's really important to me as well. And I've noticed that too that I've been doing more deals with people who I know, who I trust who I know aren't trying to get one over on me. Genuine relationship. And yes. And so now we're working something where we know there's no feeling out as far as, is this person trying to get one over on me? Are they using comps from three months ago to try and bolster their argument for why their cards are worth this? If you have that understanding, like if me and you were to work out a deal, we know that we're not trying to get one over on each other because we know each other. We have a good relationship. We're friendly, we're fair. And so if you have that relationship, it's great to just keep it going. And I feel like that's kind of another avenue that we're both trying to go down in a kind of a tumultuous market right now. Yeah. Um, the last, not even listener question, but point. Uh, my buddy Al, who I actually saw tonight, he is NYC Hoops Collector, also Level Up Cards on Instagram. He's a New York guy, lives in Long Island. He, he actually drove me to National. I had, a, I had an awesome car going up to National, so I had a great time. So shout out to Al, who I saw tonight. He said, nice and simple, I enjoyed the personal stories. Keep it real and keep it about the cards. Keep it about the cards. Keep and as you cards, know, Craig, I got to mention it. I got to mention it again. As Mike Breen told me, hmm. it always Your goes buddy, back Mike to talking Breen. about the game. So, and my mom also commented real quick before we wrap up here. She said, I love the warmth. I love the enthusiasm, love the, the jokes, which sometimes can be corny, but again, not bad to be corny. You just have to pick your spots. She said, the only thing she was looking for was a little more information, a little more numbers. And I think we delivered that today with trading art and science. And I said, episode one was more of an introduction to get to know us. So if you haven't watched or listened to episode one, maybe consider because you get a little bit of a background and really why we wanted to start this podcast and uh, just continue having fun and growing the hobby. And we will be interviewing people uh, in the future. So we might have your Philadelphia assistant principal on. I'm pretty sure we'll have the sports card therapist on uh, Rob, our good buddy in our wolf pack, and maybe a few of our other uh, members of the wolf pack as well. Ken and Dave uh, DJ sports cards and uh, sports card lessons. So, you know, what do you think, partner? Are we are we all set here? I think we're all set. I hope people listen to this and just think to themselves, yeah, these two, you and I, uh, enjoy cards. We enjoy talking about it. There's no, like, serious gain from this other than just having a good time. And maybe there's one little bar in there that this individual really resonated with or something. Someone learned just one little tidbit, you know. So open to suggestions. 
keep the listener questions and the comments going. And I mean, as long as we're still in the hobby, come on, we're always going to have stuff to talk about. Yes. And we have countless topics. We probably have 20 different topics already picked out. So we're having fun already. We're looking forward to keeping this thing rolling and just continuing to grow the hobby, share some of our stories. And like you said, if they resonate, perfect. If it don't apply, let it fly. This is me flapping my wings. I don't know if you can see it on the full screen. Maybe that's a shout out to our boys at Cousins Collectibles, their podcast. Their eagles are flying high. Listen, that that is why you're the best in the business. Shout out to Tony and Oz. Yes, the cousins. Hey, we'll, we'll have to market to them a little bit. Maybe try to get them on with a. We'll have a four a quad box. Like uh, we'll look like Scott Hansen on uh, NFL Red Zone. I like it. Yeah, no, they're they're good dudes, and I, I I reached out to them the other day, and I said, you know what, you guys showed us what it means to have a, a duo podcast in the sports card uh, world. So. Shout out to them for setting the bar high. They seriously did. And I messaged them. They showed support for us. So it just seems like a big family involving the cousins. There you go. Um, I guess we'll see you next week. We sure will. Episode three coming soon. Crosstown Cardboard. Out. Peace.